go straight over to you, okay? So I'm going to turn my camera off and um, you're on. Okay, right. Okay. Can you see? Oh, hang on. Can you see it? Yep. <laughs> yeah, looks good. Hang on, I need to... Does that work? Yeah, yep. it works for me. Yeah. Good. All right, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So, uh, yeah, it's good to be here um, and, to, and to have a chance to, to show you what, uh, what we're doing here down in Elgin. And um, just a little, about, a little bit about, about myself. Um, so I'm a, um, a winemaker for the last 20, 26 years, um, originally actually from, from the UK. So I, I wasn't obviously, I was a wine sort of more wine selling wines in, in London many years ago. And I was actually a chef at the time, but um, I moved to various countries. In fact, I had a bit of a stint in, in Sonoma uh, many years ago at Simi Winery um, and did a lot of stagiaire work. But um, up until uh, coming to South Africa, I've been, I've been, um, I made wines for mostly Mulderbosch uh, for many years and, and also Carnu. But um, in 2012, I started my own project here in Elgin. So relatively new um, as a seller. And I'm actually a virtual winemaker. So I make my wines here in Elkin, but I don't own any cellars um, or any vineyards. I actually use two custom crush um, cellars and I source from about five or six different Chardonnay growers. I, we, we make Chardonnay, Pinot and, and Syrah. Um, so different, obviously different growers for so most of those. And we use about 11 different parcels just for the Elgin range, which is the um, clonal selection, the ones just straight behind me, uh, the picture picture behind me. And um, the custom crush ones are more uh, uh, what, what I call adapted sellers. So um, they are, they're not just sort of, you can imagine sort of large cooperatives. They're very small sellers. In fact, I helped build one of them. And I've adapted it with using my own machinery. Um, I've got two presses that I bought, um, a, you know, a, a basket press and a, a pneumatic. And I've, you know, got a sort of rotovib D stemmer, so quite a fancy D stemmer. And 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 also I bought a lot of my stainless steel tanks, obviously my eggs and and my barrels. Um, so yeah, just kind of gives you a bit of a picture. Um, so before we kind of launch too much into it, is um, Elgin is a is a region that actually isn't. Um, particularly wine orientated, it's in fact an apple region, and 80% is actually slightly conservative. It's, it's closer to 90% nowadays, but it's uh, an apple region, and it's the top apple region in um, South Africa, and also the most profitable, um, apparently one of the most profitable wine, no, sorry, most profitable um, arable regions in, in the Southern Hemisphere. So um, it's a bit of a fight to actually put apple, put, put vines here, but as I mentioned at the start, or Barbara alluded to, we they started planting in 1989, but not not a lot was planted then. Most of the plantings actually took place much later um, in the 2000s, and so most of the vineyards here are um, sort of up to 20, 25 years old, and and there's and they're still planting some, so there's some nice young stuff as well. Um, personally, I think what makes the region suitable for apples, which I'll explain just now, makes it actually even better for wine. So um, hopefully um, we, we will reverse the trend and get more, more um, wine grapes over the, over the coming, coming decades. But as I say, it's a, it's a very young wine region. So just to give an idea where we are, um, we are about 70 kilometers from Cape Town. And importantly, despite our proximity, you'll see other regions here which are more, no, more well known, like Stellenbosch, um, Franschuk Paul, and so on and so forth. There's very, very big topographical changes as you man maneuver around the, the wine regions. And um, this is something that's very, very particular um, between say Cape Town and, and Elgin. It, it, 70 kilometers sounds absolutely nothing, but there's a vast, vast difference. We are you know, uh, quite, quite considerably different climatically, which I'll explain in a minute. And that's largely because of the way that our little region is. And I want to say a little region, it is a little one. It's, it's, it's only has about 8,000 hectares of land for arable and the, the rest is all mountains. And you can see here, um, it's a cross section. So what you've effectively see on the, on the false base side, which is the area towards Cape Town and up to Stellenbosch is a lower lying sort of uh, 140 meters above sea level. Whereas here, most of our vineyards between 300 and, and 500 meters above sea level. And that's basically protected all around from a sort of like a dome shape. I'll just sort of highlight it here better where you've got that clear dome, which, which actually circles the entire region. And, and all the mountains, uh, even the smaller ones are about 700 meters in the front. 
Um, but it also, it also allows us to get this inf impact from the sea, which you can see right next to us, and the back of the mountains, which rise up to about 1,400 meters. So um, we're also, we're the coolest climate in, in, in South Africa. And I think when people talk about South Africa generally, they often are, you know, shocked to find a cool climate because everything seems incredibly warm and hot and, you know, big, powerful wines. But we are, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not a cold, a, cold, a cold climate by any stretch, but we have 1,502 degree days. You'll see on that Ammer and Winkler, that's sort of right in the middle of region two between cool and warm. Um, and that's what makes the region so interesting. And, and in fact, there's no other region in that in that particular category. Um, even Hermanus and, and Elam tend to be just a little bit, a little bit warmer. So just before I go through the kind of why Chardonnay is so special, which is part of my, my brief, I just thought maybe um, I wanted to broaden a little bit of the narrative and, 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 and talk about the history of why I, I'm actually here in the first place. And as I mentioned, I, I used to be a chef and I did various um, uh, wine courses to, to actually put me into, into a wine arena, um, be it from selling it to, to making it. But actually, one of the things that I studied, um, as, as, as Barbara studied with me at one point, was the Master of Wine. And one of my challenges was not just all the passing of it, that was obviously its challenge in its own way, um, but it was also the fact that um, we used to have to sit these um, blind tasting papers um, which, which were a source of much, um, uh, uh, much, much challenges and teeth gnashing. But South Africa as a country was often poorly represented, not, not necessarily because the wines were poor, the, some of the wines were fantastic, but it was poorly represented in that perhaps we hadn't sold the country as a uniquely regional area. We, 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 talk, we heard uh, Jasmine talking about, you know, the little parcels that she's got, they're all have different things. We were, we were kind of broad brushing here in South Africa saying, you know, oh, we can grow anything we want. And yet we had this slightly kind of, oxymoron here because we had a huge history going back right down to sort of the 15 1600s um, and yet yet clearly either we've not learned anything in 400 years or or we're just still struggling to find out what works well but my biggest thing is we we do know what works well but I suppose we're just apprehensive and and lack the confidence to to say what works the best because then we could go forwards and so one of the challenges where, when I was doing these practical papers is that when it came to dissecting, you know, all these wines that we, we, we had in our glass and we often had to sort of decide what the origin was, um, we, we would sort of find a French wine and we would look at, obviously France wasn't, wouldn't be a close enough guess. It would have to be Burgundy and then Chasse Montrachet. That would be a sort of real drilling down of, of, of region. And similarly, Australia wasn't either good enough. It would be South Australia, possibly in Adelaide Hills or, or Western Australia and uh, Margaret River. But um, here in South Africa, we... Um, it was just enough to say South Africa, you know, there wasn't that sort of, oh, no, there's, they're, they're all the same. And yet we, we knew here in South Africa, we have a vast difference between Walker Bay and Robertson and Stellenbosch. Um, the, the challenge was that I felt that perhaps we needed to, to express that. And, and this is one of the reasons I moved to Elgin straight after um, to an area which I really felt had a, a chance to show this tower that that both Bother and Jasmine um, alluded to. Um, I call it a sense of place. I suppose that's my English sort of background here um, because I think it's an area which can make exceptional Chardonnay. And I, I wanna sort of go through those regions uh, why I think it's so exceptional. So firstly, let's sort of examine what a sense of place is. And I'm gonna focus on climate mostly. Um, I have only 20 minutes and I've already used about five or six of them. So. Um, the soil, the topography, and uh, clone. We'll talk a little bit about the clone at the end. Um, as you can see uh, whoop, up here, clonal selection is something I play a lot with, but um, it's only a small part of the equation. And then a little bit about the wine and um, winemaking and viticulture and, and, and the maturation of those wines, uh, which I think is an incredibly important part of it. Um, as we discussed earlier, probably repairs and maintenance also should be part of that, but still. Um, so. Let's have a look. So climate includes the latitude. Um, it includes, excuse me, um, includes the altitude, um, the vineyard site and the, and the wind. And I'm just going to say a few things about the first two, because at latitude, we're clearly not that far south. We're about 36 south. So we're not, not vastly north like Burgundy is, but um, we have an interesting aspect because we are tempered by the Atlantic Ocean. And that clearly is one of the reasons why viticulture is at all possible at those, at those lower latitudes. Um, altitude, I already talked about. Um, we are considered to be a little higher than most vineyard sites, not the highest, there are other areas which are even higher, but, but it's, it's one of the higher ones, and certainly one of the southerly most higher ones, so you're getting that, that the fact that it's more south facing, sorry, more southerly and, 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 and fairly high. Um, 
it also we took and I took a little bit about um, humidity, a bit about water availability. Um, and right at the end, I'm going to talk about light intensity, but I'm not going to get too detailed because I'm definitely going to run out of time by that stage and the last two in particular. So let's just talk about the temperature role, because um, in our region, we are uh, we get relatively cold during the winter. In fact, we're actually one of the colder regions. So um, we have these funny things called cold units, which has never been fully explained to anybody. And even in the annals of research is, is tricky. But basically, once you you need about 700 cold units to to get proper dormancy for Chardonnay. And in most regions, you simply don't get that that amount. Um, you actually need a thousand cold units for apples, and in this region, we do get over a thousand. So that's actually important for apples, but actually brilliantly good for Chardonnay. So we get a proper dormancy, and this is important because one of the challenges that Chardonnay has is it's very very susceptible to um, esker um, or your tipios. So that will shorten its lifespan. And in fact, a lot of Chardonnays here tend to sort of give up life at about fifteen to twenty years old. And and, and for those who know their the Burgundian um, grapes will know that actually you get vines going up to 60, 65 years old. So here, you know, we're hoping once we get into those realms, because obviously, as I say, we're a young wine region, we actually can get vines that are longer because we'll have proper dormancy, It'll allow that sap to properly go to sleep and the Chardonnays to sort of recover during the winter side. You can see the left-hand one is actually frosted at about minus four degrees. Um, secondly, also is the temperature in the, in the growing season. And that's also clearly critical because um, you know, the, the, the mean February temperature at 19.7 is actually the coolest of all the regions. And um, yet, actually, we don't pick in February. Most of our Chardonnay, most of it's picked towards some of it at the end of February, um, and most of it is in March. And the temperatures there is actually even cooler. So what you're finding is that the summer temperatures generally are, and, and those temperatures leading up to pick, are much, much cooler. Um, and importantly, they also are cool at night. Those exp we experience nighttime temperatures that dip below 15 degrees. Um, in many cases, over over uh, below 10 degrees, which is which is fantastic. So we're getting a, some diurnal shift as well. What it, what is also useful to mention is that we also don't get the high temperatures here. Um, generally, we measure them in hours. We had about we have usually about between five and eight hours a, a year over 35 degrees centigrade, and um, uh mostly we, we we you know mostly obviously the rest is below that this, this year we actually only got up to 34 it was one of the coolest years we've ever had um but generally we get a little bit of time and um there's various reasons for that which i'm going to come on to as we go into the rainfall and the cloud cover so um we're we're a fairly wet region as jasmine jasmine was saying that they get 230 centimeters so 2300 so we're definitely not as wet as that um but generally in the bigger scheme of things uh, when we look at burgundy at 650 or bordeaux at 950 and and Selenbosch at 500 and, and Swartland at 295, um, the average at, at one oh, one, over 1,000 mils is actually relatively high. And in our mountains, we're getting obviously almost double that, uh, which means that we actually have great water sources, um, which is important in a region that, that, that grows apples. But importantly, also, we don't, we, we do, we, we call it a Mediterranean climate here, although I'm, I'm susceptible that actually we do get quite a bit of summer rain as well and it's spread over the whole season so actually there's a, a good third of that rain is falling outside of the winter period um and that has a big impact on us sometimes obviously clearly quite good to keep everything going especially at Veraison, but but not always the best thing for rot pressure uh, rot um rot pressure disease pressure and so on and so forth um but it does keep the the soils relatively wetter um, and has an impact also on the way that our humidity works as well. It also means we have less water stress. In fact, um, we'll talk about that later, but, but basically we can grow permanent cover crops, which in itself then keeps the soils cooler as well, plus reduces that little bit of soil erosion. So that's a, a, a quite a useful boon, although in those years when it is wetter, and this year was a particular problem, um, we, do, we did have high levels of rot, and, and of course we won't get the ripeness levels, so we'll end up with much lower alcohols, which you know, is, is a good thing to an extent, depending on how low, um, but um, not always not always a good thing if it's too low. So, yeah, the wind, I think, is one of the biggest factors. And, and for those who have been to South Africa, they'll have experienced um, summer southeaster, which is the one on the bottom. Um, I've even got little um, things that move as well. So we'll, we'll start that off. Um, so the southeast is critical for or call, call the Cape Doctor. It blows really from about September onwards. And in the sort of period before climate change, it, it blew basically from up until about December time. Now it seems to go right into January, February, and uh, can be a problem even later than that now as well. And this is an important 
wind because in the in the in the in the way that it flows is it actually ameliorates a little bit of the temperature in the regions on the other side of the mountain so towards the top part of the graph but in elgin what it does it brings us massive cloud cover and i'm going to show you a picture in a minute which which highlights how that cloud cover works because it actually gives a lid to the elgin region and that has a big effect on on the way that the wind actually operates we also get the northwester in the in this this is where most of our rain comes from and this is happening now because we have the um, the wind coming from uh, the north in the in the northwest in the in the winter, so that's where our winter rainfall. And obviously, we do get warm days, and on those warmer days, we also get these massive sea breezes coming in from the from the ocean, and that's cooling us down quite dramatically um, from about two o'clock. So that has a big impact on keeping the, the nighttime temperatures um, cooler in, in in the night. So, so you can see that picture here. So. In the foreground, you've got the vineyards here in Elgin, and it's actually that's a Syra block um, that I've got there. But in the back, you can see blue sky, and that's actually on the other side of the mountain pass um, going towards Cape Town. So you can have a, a situation like this when in, de, in the middle of December, where it's our coolest, sorry, our, 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 our warmest type of the year, it can be about 14 and a half, 15 degrees here with even a little bit of a light drizzle, and it can be 28, 30 degrees across the other mountain. And just to give you an identity, that's only 25 kilometers from the other, to the other side. So it's really, really quite close. But there's vast, vast differences in, 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 um, in temperature. Um, it's important because these low clouds which come in, and we also get these morning mists. I haven't got a nice picture of that, but um, we get these morning mists that come in and create this massive filtered sunlight. Um, and this has an impact reducing the canopy temperature and also has an effect of on the ultraviolet B radiation, which is something I've looked into because um, this is important for ripening. When, when you have nice blue sunny skies, you've got lots of ultraviolet B. It generally forms between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon um, or up to 4 o'clock. And it has an, a role on something called absinthic acid, which is a, basically a, a vehicle to move sugars or, a, or an indicator for sugars to move into your grape canopy. And that means your grape berry becomes a lot more um, sugar rich, which of course is important if you're wanting to ripen it. But actually in, in the effect of the fact that we have often too much sun here, it actually has having lower, less, uh, or sorry, more cloud cover, it actually reduces and filters that sunlight. So your sugar accumulation is just that much slower and your phenolic ripeness actually continues at, pace, at a good pace. So you actually end up being able to pick it at a, at a lower potential alcohol, which to me gives you a little more subtler fruit. Um, I mentioned the humidity. We we have a little bit more humid, a lot more humidity here than than in the regions before. I've I've worked with which is Stellenbosch. It's usually about sixty to sixty five. Although this, this this is a little out of date. It's actually a lot now closer. I don't know if it's climate change or what, but we get more closer to seventy seventy five. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons we've had increased rot and and thunderstorms, which the Cape never experienced prior, prior to sort of I think two thousand. But um, this is something we're seeing a lot more. But it also keeps that cloud cover, keeps the moisture, and importantly, has an impact on something called vapor pressure deficit, which is the amount of um, sort of moisture available around the vine's canopy. And that has an impact on reducing the need for water. And in fact, this is something that has a big impact on having to have irrigation, which ironically, we don't need in this region, but we actually have it because of a lot of the farmers who were apple farmers have by default put irrigation and, and therefore the vines have had that. So increasingly, there's a chance and movement to, to, to more dryland farming, which would be, I think, more sensible. Um, I'm going to keep it going. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, as I mentioned, so there's less evapotranspiration. We have um, also, uh, as I say, low, low irrigation needs. Um, and of course, these these do create high humidity. So, so we do have the tendency to have problems with rot. All the grapes canopies are generally too um, opened up. Um, so we open up on both sides sometimes, um, but certainly on the on the afternoon side, which is confusing because most people do on the morning side. But we um, we don't get such massive temperatures in the afternoon, um, and that that's also largely to do with 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 point of day. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We also get. Um, that when dew forms on the leaves, it tends to much happen much earlier in the summer. I was always amazed when I moved here that by January, we're already getting that, whereas in Selenbosch, I rarely got it until March. And it's a problem because if you are picking vineyards from east to west, those southern side vineyards will get problems with rot much sooner because obviously there's no way to dry them out. And in fact, when I was doing samples, I would have to wait until after half past 11 before they actually dried out. So that, that's a potential issue. Um, so you have to work your canopies slightly differently, in fact, vastly differently here than you would in a, in a different region. Um, another smaller point is that we do pick a lot later. So that means that um, not only we're a large region to pick, but our delayed ripening means that it's, it, it is actually toward much more towards the sort of summertime. Um, sorry, sorry, towards the autumn time away from summer. 
And this is also important because those autumn temperatures, as you saw on that previous slide of March, being March is lower, but also we're getting much slower sugar development, um, good, good accumulation of flavor and aroma compounds. But it also, also keeps, we, we get retention of higher acidity much, much later, and, and it doesn't tend to go away. And our malic acids are actually massively high. Um, it, it also means we are picking on a shorter day length because clearly by that stage, we are starting to see noticeable reduction as the nights start to, to um, get longer. Uh, lastly, um, I'm gonna see how we're getting here. Um, <laughs> the, um, I just wanted to mention a slightly more techie thing, but I'll go through it. But um, we, we're getting actually a lot more nerisoprenoid development for, for Chardonnay, which is a big thing. It's a C13 alcohol and it's actually works um, works on the principle that what, it starts to release itself in the grapevine because of, well, basically because it's it's imagining winter's arriving. So the grapevine itself is realizing, hang on a sec, we've still got bunches here. We need to get them off. And of course, their interest is, is something needs to eat them, birds, whatever you want to have. In our case, we've got birds and baboons, um, which which took a nearly a ton of my grapes this year, but anyway, um, another story. But the thing is that it, those those stress signals mean that it will start to release these interesting flavonoids. Um, and that's something we capture quite nicely um, by picking them. And that they happen, as I mentioned, uh, in this um, in the ripening cycle because we're picking it towards the more autumnal side. So I'm going to I'm going to move on. I, I did have a slide about soils. I don't want to get too into bold, but um, there are different soils. And you can see but being a basin shaped, you're going to have sort of sandstones on the side. Then you've got a lot of shales in the middle and a, and a bit of sort of what we call Takula Glen Rose. So these are gravelly and partly granite soils um, and a bit of quartz that sticks in there. But I'm going to go through why why we talk about it. So we're, we're right bang in the middle. Now, bang in the middle means nothing because, as I said, we take from lots of different growers. It just happens to be where the custom crush cellar is. And as I mentioned, we do two of them. So we've got another one slightly to the northwest of that. And I did mention I would say a few words on clones. Um, I'm hoping to get how are we, how are we doing here. Um, the, uh, we, we always have this slide, it's just a silly one about clones are not something that are sort of weird and wonderful. There's no genetic engineering or manipulation. Um, it's all about natural development. And, and one of the things that that is done over the years is, is getting clones that actually have good intensities, good um, flavor profiles and so on and so forth. You know, by, by, by interesting years ago, it was a, a lot was clearly developed from getting Chardonnay clones or, or any clone to be honest, based on quantity rather than uh, quality. Nowadays, it's mostly obviously all about quality, as we know, and, and we use a number of different clones in our clonal selection uh, Chardonnay, which I hope a few of you have got, who knows. Um, we use a bit of 76, not, um, it gives lovely fine aromatic, it's a, it's a more broad, fine floral sort of style, quite light, we, we um, have sort of much more melon fruits and, and a richer palate structure. Um, they, they actually all our clones are from Burgundy, so um, we, we, we they're called the Dijon clones here, or, or in Australia the Bernard clones. But they're all developed in in the University of Dijon. We also use this, the 95. I'm going to whip through these a little bit faster, uh, so we can talk about the winemaking. But um, this is one of the most popular ones. Sorry, the let's go back the the 95. It's a uh, it's it has a bit more richness, even though it's tightly structured, um, and it's something that gives a, a wonderful sort of yellow or white peach in in El Elgin more. It's a white peach, and it gives great aging potential. And for those who have had the deconstructed, the single vineyards, they are particular for that. Um, we also have the 96. This is a little more nervous, slightly linear style, not much on the fruit side, but much more of that savory character. And then a more recent clone is a 548. This is actually a from Cordon Charlemagne. It has a bit more expression, a bit more robustness. It's a bit more structured. Um, it actually forms the backbone of Cordon Charlemagne in Burgundy. So you can see. So let's quickly go to the vinification. Um, so, you know, we, we do the usual thing. We, we try and avoid actually any, any form of, um, uh, you know, in, sort of manipulation, because as I mentioned at the start, it's all about a sense of place. So the last thing we want to do is to start making wines where we start to jiggery, do, do jiggery pokery with all the, all the grapes coming in. So we actually pick them um, and whole bunch press them, and then they go straight into barrel. We do, a, we, we, we do homogenization in the tank, but we don't settle them or anything. It's a full solids um, barrel ferment. And one of the things that we tend to also do is we pick by not just block, but by um, clone in the block. So I mentioned we had five or six growers. We've got 11 different parcels, but actually in those parcels are several clones. So we end up picking 21 batches and those batches will be made up of the clones that you just saw now. And what we tend to do is we will have a clone like 95, maybe on a on a more shale soil, which has a bit more breadth and power, and the 95 has a bit more richness. So we will actually, we has, have an algorithm we've developed to, to match those with the, with the coopers that we're gonna use. And we, we tend to use mostly um, uh, 
uh, Burgundian coopers. In fact, we only use Burgundian coopers and uh, by default, all French wood. But um, we tend to use those coopers in a different way, depending on the type of cooperage and also the, 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 the toasting and stuff, depending on the, on the clone and the soil type. Um, and that's something, and, and also the, the amount of new wood. So certain lighter clones that are a bit lighter and a little bit more lightweight sandstone will, will tend to go into more second fill barrels. I didn't mention, sorry, as I go forwards, I'm rushing here, that we don't use, we all do a natural ferment. Um, these, there's no, we don't use enzymes or acid or anything. We try and preserve what we have to, to as I mentioned, give us the, the whole thing. Sorry, here's my slide I was after. So yeah, barrel fermentation, all in French oak. We also use the, these breathable plastic eggs that are very popular called Apollo, Apollo eggs. Um, actually, they're called Apollo capsules, I should be correct. And the, we use ceramic spheres as well. So we have the chance to do something outside of just the barrel maturation. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to do. And I, I'm just going to have a slight arrogance because that's part of what we're trying to do. We, we, we're trying to not just give a sense of place, but we're trying to produce, um, you know, world-class wines within, you know, within the world rather than good South African wines. It's, it's part of trying to apply every attention to detail. And if I can, before we, we, we look at the wines, one of the points that I really feel strongly to make is that, you know, the climate is critical, soil is also critical, but they all make up a sort of, um, a, they all metrics in a, in a bigger formula. And if you have, if you, if you gave it 100%, you know, 40% is climate, say 20, 25% soil, and then you're going to add your, the, the viticultural techniques, the winemaking techniques, and the clones are important, but they're never more than two, three, four percent of what you're kind of trying to do. They tweak the final wine. But of course, if you're wanting to get that 95 points, you're going to have to, you know, in a sort of rather crude terminology, you're going to have to tweak it in, in that point. Because um, as I, you know, and I, I consult for a few wineries, as I mentioned, and, uh, you know, all they want is high scoring point wines. And of course, it's, it, it, you know, as winemakers, we, you know, we feel we're pretty confident about making a high, you know, a wine that's 85 or 90. But to make it better than that, you have to try an awful lot harder. It's that, that last two, three, two or three kilos you're trying to lose when, you, when you're on a diet. It's easy to start with. But once you want it to go higher than, than a 90, you've got to actually apply all your sort of abilities. And this is where focusing on what the clones and, and the barrels and all those sorts of things and tasting the wines. We, we, we taste every single barrel every six weeks. We've just come off the back of tasting all our Syrah 2020s. And, and next week we'll be doing all the 21 Pinots. So this is something you've got to keep in mind to see what, what needs to happen. Um, we don't want to have a broad brushed approach to winemaking. We're not going to say, okay, well, everything needs batonage. We, we say, well, these, one, these barrels need a batonage according to what their flavor profile is. These ones need a rack. They actually have too much reduction or whatever. So it's really about trying to manipulate um, what you do with the barrels, uh, what we do with the wine on, a, on an ad hoc basis. We also actually analyze every single barrel, which is far too expensive. And our, our, our laboratory bill is, is, is through the roof. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, if you have got the selection, I, um, I know that the, 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 some of you have the 17. I've actually got, uh, I've got the 18 here, but... Um, some of you may have the 18. So they're made up of those four clones, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'm not going to get too fo focused. The 17 was a, was a pretty smart vintage. Um, how are we doing? Oh, we're getting a little, little bored to the end of the time. But anyway, um, maybe, maybe try the wine. So I'll just run through what the, uh, that's the 18 for those who have it as well. And then just the last quick sort of mention that I, I, I do, do these 21 different single sites and um, they all go into a clonal selection at the end of the day. But what I do is I, the four of my sites I use, I actually bottle under a deconstructed or single vineyard, single site, single clone um, label. And uh, one of the ones is the is the um, the deconstructed uh, CY548. So you can see here, um, if you've got the bottle, it's CY548 is the clone, that, that's the Cordon Charlemagne clone. It's on shale soils, I've alluded to. And I've given it sort of a twee name, I suppose. Jasmine mentioned mapping her Hirsch vineyards onto Burgundy. And, um, you know, they've got lovely exotic names in, in um, Burgundy, and we haven't got anything exotic. So Hrunland is sort of my kind of regional area. So like, a, you know, I'd like to feel it would be Jevry champaton perhaps, and, and Lakes, Lake District, which is one of the other ones, would perhaps, perhaps be Maurice saint denis or something. So the idea is here is me breaking down the Elgin region in a very nerdy way into seven different sort of sub-appellations, um, apart from, you know, under the Elgin sort of banner. And trying to sort of explain why they are different because they're all different. Kroonland is mountain behind us. It's obviously giving different effects than Palmeet or Lake District, which is a more sort of, um, that, that, that was that first picture with a beautiful Palmeet river in front of it. Um, that was showing more influence probably from the, from the, um, uh, from the river itself. And it's at a lower altitude. It's 300 meters. Whereas this one here is, is more at 420 meters above sea level. So yeah, I think that kind of wraps me up. Um, I've just about before six. So um, yeah, over to you, Barbara. 
No, well done, <laughs> Richard. That was a bit of a marathon. And again, I learned new things there. Um, I didn't know about uh, C13 and those terpenes and flavonoids. So um, always um, something uh, new and interesting. I think, um, you know, I, I love what you both do. And I think what you've really shown in, in both the presentations is how, you know, you really break it down really to the fine minutia, the detail just on the sites. And, and how you vinify and, and make the wines. Um, there's no more questions in the Q&A, but I just have one question coming on the back of what you were just saying there, Richard, about ratings. And, um, you, know, you know, you mentioned them, obviously they are important. And I just wonder how important, if you can quantify in any way how important they are, or if there are any particular you know, critics or reviewers or magazines or whatever that are more important than others. Do you want to? Gosh, it's a good I'd question. Love you both to answer that. Yeah, um, I think that you know that there, there clearly are you know some fantastic tasters, fantastic people who are doing stuff. And uh, as a younger winery, when we started, they are very important to you because they give you exposure to a bigger, world, wider world. Um, as that exposure is harnessed, you can start to you know, you start to get people who follow you and sort of understand and trust your barrel uh, and trust your and trust your brand. And so perhaps they are less important, but they still help. They still embellish the brand if they get a good score. And, you know, we, we'll, we'll certainly probably bandy it around if we have. I mean, there's no harm in that. Um, yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, that, that, that it, it's, it's a useful it's a useful tool for sure. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't you know, there's so many of these things as well, and it depends, you know, which which market you're in. I mean, clearly, that that's important too. If we're selling into Ireland or or in the States, then it's then it's clearly a different type of approach we have to have, and and Japan likewise. So, um, yeah. What about you, Jasmine? Do you do you have a view on critics or how important I, they I mean, are to you? I have to say, I agree with Richard. I think um, for newer wineries, it can be really important. It's you know, press is such a powerful way to get the word out. Um, we really try to engage with all of the important critics um, and, um, you know, are grateful for any media coverage. Uh, we do find that the main way that we meet private customers, you know, we have a, a, a network of private customers. It's about 50% of our total sales um, every year is private customers in the U.S. Um, we find that the main way that we meet those people is through restaurants. They had our wine in a restaurant. Word of mouth. Um, from their friends, you know, they had a bottle at a friend's house or their friend told them to get on the list. Um, very, very little is, is through scores because I think there's so many critics now and there's so many great wines. You know, I, people talk about score inflation, but I also just think wines have gotten better. There's so much good wine out there. So, you know, you get a 95, well, that's great, but there's a lot of great wines getting 95s. I will say that during COVID, when restaurants were shut down, you know, restaurants for the other half of our business, you know, restaurants were the majority of that. Um, so we were suddenly selling a lot more wine to retailers where scores are more important. And it was very helpful to have the scores. It, I think in this wide ocean of wine, it can provide some context. Um, it can act as a filter, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with Richard. Like if we get a good score, we might send an email. It can be helpful. Um, but it's not a primary driver of our business. Um, but I, I do really like interacting with the critics. It's always so interesting to see what, you know, and I always like to ask them like, what, are, what do you think of Sonoma County Pinot Noir in this vintage? Like, because they taste everything. So the good critics you can really learn from. Um, I don't always agree with them, but um, it's always a, a good learning experience. Yeah, yeah. and that's interesting. There's just a question into the Q&A there, which, um, yeah kind of comes, touches on that question of, you know, how much stock you have, I suppose, and how it might have been affected um, with COVID and particularly you in South Africa, Richard, with the export restrictions and the restrictions on the sale of wines indeed internally in the country. Um, if yeah, you answer uh, it. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, the, 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 the answer to your question is the export um, restrictions that we had only lasted for about three to four weeks because somebody then reminded the government that the ban on alcohol which was the whole idea to reduce 
um, inpatient sort of emergency response kind of thing going on um, wouldn't affect exports on the basis that somebody else is drinking them. It would only affect their emergency response you know, over in Ireland or in the States. So it, it was quite a bizarre concept that, that we had to have these restrictions, but somebody finally figured it out after three or four weeks. Um, so that was lifted. So that was relatively short. The actual ban obviously was massively long. I think it was 212 days when effectively we couldn't really sell alcohol because unfortunately here we had um, also the problem that we had massive curfews. So restaurants simply couldn't open to, um, to punters. You know, we had these curfews, which meant that they would have to go home at six o'clock or seven o'clock, which meant for the staff, there was only really a chance to do um, sort of a lunchtime menu. And so it just was a disaster. Um, however, the impact of the pandemic has been an, had an effect on the workers in the docks because the teams that we have on Cape Town, we have something like seven or eight teams that was reduced to two. And the problem is, is that um, that that has had an impact and still. And we even got a missive yesterday about that. But it still has problems because of, you know, the fact that not everybody's at work because there's only so many teams and they had obviously, you know, skeleton staff and then some staff here and some there and then problems with you know, somebody getting COVID and all this sort of business. So that, that has been a constant battle. Um, and, and it still is a problem. It uh, still, still is right now. And I think that has a problem. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. And how much of your wines do you export, um, Richard? I mean, Jasmine mentioned... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an interesting point. So we, we export 97% of all our wines. That's, uh, you know, we, we, we just, um, you know, for, for the wines that we're approaching here, we don't sell that much locally. However... In response to the COVID and the pandemic, we sold the most direct to custom we've ever done in our entire lives. Um, because basically uh, we decided, we, we weren't sure, but we had a lot of you know, fantastic people who were here. And one of the things that came up was we had a couple, actually we didn't have a couple, we had eight people sitting in my tasting room, um, which is a bit of a ramshackle affair. And basically um, the only reason they were with me and they bought Vosk, they bought, I think they placed the biggest sort of single order we've ever had for direct to customer, they were all my deconstruct and everything. And the only reason was that they were supposed to be in Tuscany in their villa and they weren't able to go. So, you know, clearly all that money would have been spent on, you know, business class tickets or whatever they were flying and villas. So clearly they had money to spend, which has been a, a kind of a weird, weird offshoot because if you can't go to a restaurant and you can't do anything, and restaurants, because of that, people have actually spent more money because they've suddenly seen that in restaurants they spend, you know, you, for the same wine, it's a lot more expensive. So, you know, if, if there's a, a sense, I, I think there's a sense. I mean, I remember years ago living in London, there's people who go out almost the entire time. They wouldn't have a clue how much a retail bottle sells for. So they just assume that's how much it is and suddenly find that when they buy it directly, it's actually a third of the price. So, um, yeah, they're happy to, and they're happy to buy more. And, they, and of course, they're all buying much more wine. So, yeah. And so just in relation to that direct to consumer channel, because obviously it is a, a much bigger thing, I think, in California, isn't it, Jasmine? Just, Richard, do you feel that that's something that you'll develop or was that just more like a, a one off, if you like, during the COVID years or are you going to kind of do a bit more of it? No, we, we, we're definitely developing that. Yeah, no, we, we've been developing it a lot more. So um, that's definitely been a, a feature that we've tried to do a lot more this year and um, reach out to those. You know, we, 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 it's been a challenge over the years, but it's starting to become a lot easier for sure. Well, another question I had for both of you um, was, and it's, I'm asking it because I actually don't know the answer to it, but you know, in terms of um, what percentage you make that is your, let's say your main wines or your, you know, the, the main brands, if you like, that you make, and what percentage do you make that's kind of like that really high-end, fine, kind of like single vineyard, the deconstructed? Oh, so what's uh, the, you know? Oh, um okay on my side um mm -hmm. so we're making about for the for the clinal selection it's about 35 well with the gps i suppose it's about 35 to forty thousand bottles um and the deconstructed is a much less it's about five thousand bottles okay so roughly yeah probably 10 percent of the of the production whereas i feel it might be different for you jasmine isn't it do you make much more of the kind of like the single vineyards relative to the more you know the, the blend it really depends upon the vintage um, and the quality of the vintage and the size of the vintage as well. Um, I think what's interesting that we see here is, you know, we have 60 parcels approximately. And, you know, this is what we know about a ground crew parcel or a very, very good parcel is it performs well regardless of the vintage. So we have this set of vineyards that will produce excellent wine every single year. 
And then on the very, you know, the, the opposite end of the quality spectrum, we have parcels that can, in a good vintage, can produce very nice wine, never super interesting, but very nice. And in a difficult vintage, the wine can be really just okay. And then it's in the middle, right? It's the premier crew, as you, if you will, that in an incredible vintage can be like a grand crew quality, right? So in those kinds of vintages, we might be able to make a bit more of the top wines. Um, and then in a lesser vintage, we, we might declassify some of the very top, top vineyards in order to, even though the quality is very high, but we'll declassify in order to keep the quality of our San Andreas Pinot Noir up. So, you know, another way to say this, in a good vintage, um, you can kind of make whatever you want. In a more difficult vintage, you might have to move things between the different cuvées in order to keep your quality standards. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically the, the answer. I mean, and then, you know, then you have a vintage like 2020 where, um, you know, half of the, the vintage is damaged by smoke. So, uh, and it was vineyard specific. So the very high altitude vineyards in 2020, for example, were more affected. Um, so we can't make a number of our top wines in 2020 at all. So, you know, and I, I think that may sound like a one-off, but one of the reasons why we were so committed to making all of our wines, you know, e picking everything, even if we won't bottle it in 2020 was because we feel that unfortunately this, this, is, this fire situation in California is only going to get worse. It, it, prior to 2020, we never had fires in the summer. So we were always, you know, as Pinot Noir producers, we were always safe. You know, the fires would start in October when we were generally done, not just picking, but we were barreled down. So it was more a problem that the later ripening varieties like the Bordeaux varieties or Syrah was, was dealing with. Um, but I think, you know, we're already facing a very dry summer. So anyways, we, we wanted to learn. And so I think, you know, we, and, then, and then we've also had vintages like 2015 where we lost you know, 75% of the potential crop due to bad weather at this time of year during bloom. So we just had terrible shatter. Um, so because of the extreme nature of being on the coast, our production can really change from year to year. So it's a bit of a difficult question to answer, but yeah. Okay, no magic answer. <laughs> no magic answer. We have to respond to the vintage and to the vineyard in that vintage. So yeah. yeah. Okay. That is cool. I've indulged myself in some questions. There are no more questions in the Q&A. Jasmine, I know that you have a, a meeting to go to. You're very good to, to stay on with us. Um, and, and to you, Richard, thank you for joining us. And I'm, I'm really happy I could get the two of you together because as yeah. I said, I do, I do think that you, know, you have a lot in common as, as well as a lot that's different. Um, your wines uh, should be um, arriving on the 6th of June. They have been delayed um, in uh, in New York due to various restrictions and Richard yours are selling out fast so hold some oh. of those wines for us um, but um, to everybody who stayed on with us all the attendees I'd like to thank them for 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 joining and, and for joining in other sessions this um, month as well and um, just um, thank you and and have a good day everyone okay thank thanks you. a million guys that was great thanks a lot thanks, cheers bye-bye